Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us at today's webinar. Welcome to our 13th webinar under the banner one on education. It is absolutely wonderful to see so many of you with us at this event. I'm Devina Chattopadhyay, Senior Editor, Orient Backspot. We are delighted and privileged to introduce our speaker for the day, Mr. Scott Thornberry. Scott Thornberry is a writer on language and methodology with far-reaching impact on the way the English language is taught in classrooms across the world. Often described as a teacher of teachers, he has taught and trained in Egypt, UK, Spain, and in his native New Zealand, and inspired teachers and ELT practitioners through innumerable webinars, conference presentations, plenaries, and blogs. His publications include several award-winning books for teachers. Some of the resources the Orient Black Swan ELT publishing team swears by are Teaching Unplugged, Dogma in English Language Teaching, How to Teach Speaking, How to Teach Vocabulary, Natural Grammar, Uncovering Grammar, How to Teach Grammar, and 30 Language Teaching Methods. These are only a selection of his best. He is also the series editor for the Cambridge Handbooks for English Teachers and a trustee of the Hands Up Project, which promotes drama activities in English for children in under-resourced regions of the Arab world. At present, he is working for the Mosaic Foundation, training teachers of refugees in the Middle East in how to integrate communicative activities into their online classes. In this webinar, his third for Orient Black Swan 1, Scott Thornberry will talk about correcting language errors as a form of feedback. He will focus on when these errors should be corrected, which errors should be corrected, and how they should be corrected. He will also look at different options for the form, frequency, and timing of corrective feedback, with special reference to oral production and discuss how these might impact learning. Thank you, Mr. Thornberry, for so readily accepting our invitation to speak. And over to you for your much awaited session. Correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you, Debina, and thank you, uh, Orient Black Swan, for making this uh, a possible, this occasion, my third uh, visit to India uh, in this series of talks. It's great to see so many people here. I know uh, that there are other people watching uh, on the um, YouTube site. Uh, and I hope I can address you and your questions. Uh, please uh, add questions to the question and answer um, box uh, and we'll try to address them at the end of the session. Uh, and I'll be asking you also to contribute to the uh, chat stream as we go along. So uh, I'm going to talk for about 30, 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll throw it open uh, to questions, which I'm sure you have. Just let me uh, share my screen with you. And we can get going. Okay, so um, this topic is correction, and I'm going to give you a sort of poll. Uh, I'm going to put up some uh, statements, and I want you to tell me in the chat whether you agree or not with each one. Yeah. So these are the questions, the sentences. Uh, in the chat, you just write the number and whether you agree or not. So if you agree with one, write one, agree, two, disagree, etc. We'll go through the statements one by one. It's not a test. Uh, it's just to give me a bit of an idea of where you are at and what your general uh, opinion is about some of these issues, for which I should add, they're not necessarily any clear answers. But the questions I think that um, engage language teachers all around the world with regard to this whole issue of error and correction. Okay, so are you ready? I'm just going to open the chat for, so I can see what's going on. 
Okay, so you're ready. So this is the first statement, whether you, so write the number again, uh, this is number one, and whether you agree or disagree. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Agree, agree, mostly agree, 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 agree. Oh, well, this is a unanimous agreement here, I think. Some slightly, yeah, yeah, wow. Okay, that was an easy one to start with. Okay, here's number two. Don't forget to write the number so we know which one you're talking about, yeah? This is number two. So write two and agree or disagree. Two, agree, 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 <laughs> disagree. Oh, we've got a disagree went flying by. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, there's a general agreement on that one as well. Okay, you ready for number three? Ready for number three? Don't forget to write the number so I know which one you're agreeing to. Okay, here's number three. If teachers don't correct learners' mistakes, they will become bad habits. More, oh, there's a disagree, a few dissenting voices here, but mostly I'm seeing a lot of a kind of agree, disagree. Aha, uh -huh. agree, 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 agree. <laughs> agree. Good evening, agree, 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 disagree, disagree. So it's not unanimity here, uh -huh. might be, might be, says somebody, agree, agree, agree. Uh, okay, ready for number four? Here's number four. Number four, don't forget to write the number. Number four, we're on, we're on number four now. Disagree, disagree, disagree with number four. Oh, we're getting a bit of disagreement here. Correcting mistakes makes students shy and afraid to speak. Disagree, maybe, no really, <laughs> sometimes. Okay, yeah, yeah, a little bit more. Not quite so cut and dry. Okay, brilliant. All right, okay, number five. Rather than correcting students, it's better to get students to correct themselves. Number five, do you agree? Yes, straight off the mark. Agree, any disagreement? Um, mm, mm, don't forget, write the number and whether you agree or disagree. Strongly agree, says someone. Okay, good. Um, okay, we've got quite a lot of consensus on this one. Not always possible, says somebody. Yes, indeed, indeed. But it's uh, uh, sometimes yes, agree, and so on. Okay, you're doing great. Okay, here's number six. So don't forget to write the number. The teacher should be selective when correcting mistakes. Number six we're on now. Disagree, disagree, disagree. Okay, disagree, general disagreement, sometimes disagree. Aha, uh aha. -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, yeah, I think the majority disagree with number six. Okay, I will come back to these and we'll discuss them in a minute, but let's just go, there's two more. Number seven, correction doesn't make much difference. Okay, we're on number seven now. So write the number, disagree, says Zabia. Aha. Uh -huh. Disagree, disagree, disagree. Not always. Strongly disagree. Okay. So there's general disagreement with number seven. And the last one, the last one, number eight, write eight. Don't forget, and this is the statement, learners' mistakes can provide useful material for teaching. Do you agree or disagree? Agree, 
many times. Fully agree. <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, fine. General agreement, I think, to number eight. But qualified agreement in some cases. Okay, fantastic. All right. Okay. Let's, uh, let's stop there. I've got a good feeling, a sense that uh, there, um, there's a consensus, particularly uh, on some of these questions like number one. And I think, yes, mistakes are an inevitable part of language learning, both in first language and second language. Children learning their first language are not uh, accurate, perfectly accurate from day one. And there's a long period where uh, children use language which we wouldn't accept as being target-like, yeah? but we accept it as being childlike. It's something that we get used to. Children saying things like daddy shopping or mummy working. Um, that's perfectly acceptable. We don't even question it. Uh, but we do question it when learners make these kind of mistakes. So yesterday I working. Now we understand them, uh, but we know that it's not standard. Uh, the feeling, general feeling is that uh, all learners go through similar stages or processes learning the second language, whether they're children, teenagers, or adults, and whether the language is English, French, Chinese, or Hindi for that matter. Um, but mistakes are an inevitable part of language learning and it's perhaps questionable, therefore, whether we should even call them mistakes uh, or simply what some researchers would call uh, interlanguage. Interlanguage meaning the language on the way to becoming target-like. Yeah? So learners go through these stages, uh, which are pretty general across all learners, irrespective of their first language. Uh, and we've got to learn to live with those mistakes, even if we don't necessarily like them. Most errors that are result number two are result differences between the learner's first language and their second language. In other words, uh, learners are, uh, errors are caused by interference. Now, this is a view that was very popular in a few decades ago, let's say in the 1970s, 1980s, when a lot of work was done contrasting languages to see where the differences were and then predicting what kind of mistakes learners would make. And there was a feeling then that the majority of errors were caused by interference. And that was one argument for not using the learner's first language when you're teaching the second language, because the two languages would kind of interfere with each other. Well, the first language would interfere with the second. Subsequently, um, researchers started to notice that, in fact, many learners, irrespective of their first language, were producing the same kinds of errors. So whether the learner's first language was Portuguese or whether the learner's first language was Korean, they would say things like, no like fish. Yeah. Irrespective of their first language. This seemed to be a stage that they went through. And it's actually a stage that children go through when they're learning English as their first language. So this suggested that a lot of errors may be less to do with interference and more to do with the natural processes of development. That is to say they are de developmental errors. They are inevitable part of the process of language learning where we tend to simplify things. We tend to focus on lexical words, the main words and sentences and ignore all the little words like the auxiliaries and the articles and that kind of thing because for ease of processing. So there was a big pendulum swing in the 19... 70s, 1980s, away from the idea that interference, first language interference was the cause of all errors. And there was some, uh, some researchers saying, in fact, that most errors were developmental, which is kind of counterintuitive. I think a lot of teachers feel, no, they recognize that that particular error has something to do with the learner's first language. We see this in, in pronunciation, 
uh, uh, we see this with false friends where learners take a word in their first language and misuse it in the second language. And we see this with grammatical structures. So again, the pendulum is kind of swinging back and research is showing that well, actually quite a few errors are to do with the learner's first language. Maybe not as many as was predicted or was, was hypothesized in the 1970s and 80s, but quite a few. So yeah, not total agreement with that statement, but partial agreement, I think. But we have to bear in mind, though, that a lot of errors are developmental. They have nothing to do with the first language. Uh, if teachers don't correct number three, correct learners mistakes will become bad habits. Well, again, the, the, the notion of bad habit, we tend to associate with theories of language learning, which perhaps have become um, a little bit uh, discredited. I'm thinking of, you know, behaviorist views of language learning, which is what uh, this notion of interference was associated with the idea of good habits, bad habits, and that the first language causes bad habits and that errors should be corrected. Otherwise, they become bad habits. And I think the whole idea of language being a habit, we need to kind of rethink a little bit. Maybe um, we should change number three and say, if uh, teachers don't correct learners' mistakes, they will become entrenched or they'll become fossilized. That's perhaps more uh consistent with modern terminology but even then uh this is not entirely true uh there are certain errors that seem to resist correction yeah uh, um you can correct them as much as you like but particularly at certain stages learners are not going to make any adjustment particularly when they're speaking in real time i'm thinking classically of the things of the third person s yeah, she go to work by bus. Uh, you can, how many times have you corrected your students on that? And how many, how much difference does it make? So um, it's, it's, and this relates to the further question, uh, number seven, whether it, in fact correction is effective, particularly at certain levels and stages of learning. But as we'll see, I think giving learners feedback. Uh, whether we call it correction or not, is very important in the learning process. Correcting mistakes makes students shy and afraid to speak. Well, this is one argument used by kind of proponents of more humanistic views of language learning, where which foregrounds the student's emotions, attitudes, feelings, etc. And it's true that particularly adults or teenagers too feel some anxiety if they're a loss of face if they're being corrected in front of their peers, yeah, in front of other students. Um, we have to take this into account. Some students are more sensitive to others. And so it's a lot to do with if we recognize that correction is important, then but we also recognize that it can cause students to feel humiliated and maybe inhibit them, then we need to think of ways of doing it, which are not threatening, yeah, which do not threaten their sense of face. Rather than correcting number five, rather than correcting students, it's better to get students to correct them. So there was general agreement here, uh, and we'll look at uh, that in a minute. But yes, I would say that that's the general feeling if they can correct themselves. And this is, this is if they can correct themselves, it often is indicative that the mistake was a kind of performance error. It was part of just like, you know, speaking and talking fast and not planning, et cetera, because of the nature of um, speaking, that you use, there's very little time to plan when you're speaking. But if you're given a prompt, say, okay, oh, that's, yeah, can you, and students often can correct themselves. If they can't, then maybe another student can correct them. Of course, that's problematic too, because it could be seen as being a little bit uh, face threatening. So there's a lot of sensitivity involved, um, as we said before, in correcting mistakes. One should be alert to to the messages that learners are sending us about how they feel about correcting. And maybe that's something we need to discuss with them, particularly if they're um, teenagers or adults. The teacher should be selective when correcting mistakes. Now, there was a lot of disagreement with this. And so I'm understanding that to mean that you should, you, you tend to think that you should correct all mistakes, irrespective of their importance. But isn't it true that some mistakes are more important than others? And the ones that are important are those that really inhibit understanding. Yeah? So if somebody says she go to work by bus, 
I, I'm not bothered so much about that because I understand, especially if they add every day. If they say yesterday she go to work by bus, then I'm getting a little bit confused here because I'm hearing yesterday and I'm hearing the present. But whether they use the third person S or not seems to be not a huge uh, problem in terms of intelligibility because we have we know that it's she, yeah. Uh, and if she should, she go to work by bus every day, uh, what's the problem? You, know, you could argue that there really isn't a problem. And certainly with English as an international language now, you could argue that these kinds of so-called errors are becoming, in a sense, codified or institutionalized in international English. Another one would be, I look forward to see you tomorrow. I look forward to see you tomorrow, rather than I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And, but I look forward to see you tomorrow. If you do a, a search engine search, you'll find that that's almost as common now as I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. So maybe we have to accept that the language is changing for a start and these things are not worth correcting because they really don't matter. Uh, it's a, it's, I realize this is a sensitive issue. It's almost a, an ideological issue to the extent in which errors you correct. And I can't rule on that. And of course, it depends a lot on your students and their aspirations uh, et cetera, and what they're capable of. Um, number seven, and there's a general feeling against that you disagreed with this, that correction doesn't uh, have any effect. Uh, there is evidence to suggest that um, it has less of an effect than we might hope. Um, and it depends, uh, again, on uh, the kind of error as we said, third person S doesn't seem to make much difference. Um, and it depends on the mode, yeah, written versus spoken, etc. Uh, there's uh, evidence to suggest that students in writing, correcting writing, don't really notice or care so much about their mistakes. And so that's something we might need to address because in writing, errors are more obvious than they are in speaking. They, they, they're permanent, they're there on the page. Uh, and number eight, we'll come back to this one, but there was fantastic agreement with number eight and I'm very pleased to see that because I want to uh, I do believe that learners uh, that errors are huge a great resource for teaching one of the best we have so I'm going to move on now from these quotes and we'll kind of be revisiting some of these ideas as we go along uh, but I want to just look at well, I mean very briefly the kind of the history of attitudes uh, as we if we go back in time uh, over half a century, we'll see statements like this, that preventing mistakes is better than correcting them. Uh, and uh, a more positive view of mistakes would say, well, you can't prevent them. You can't prevent them. And if you try to prevent them, you're going to prevent students speaking and writing. Yeah, they can only say things that you've already said. You're going to rule out any kind of creativity or real communication in the process. You cannot prevent mistakes. However, um, this is how a lot of people were trained. I was trained as a teacher, trainer, um, a little bit after 1953, but that was certainly the prevalent attitude. We should not let students make mistakes because, because somehow the mistakes would infect each other. Yeah, uh, And it was a great relief uh, early in my career when people started saying, well, actually, uh, errors are not evidence of failure. They are evidence of hypothesis testing. Yeah? So Dick Allwright said, there's 1975, the beginning of the communicative approach, suggested we should see errors as positive, yeah? not evidence of failure, as it was typically viewed, but evidence of students testing hypotheses, trial and error, yeah? and this was a good thing. Um, about, about the same time, uh, Julian Dakin, uh, wrote a book on the language laboratory where uh, looking at the kinds of exercises that were useful in language laboratory and, and realized that if you lead students to make mistakes, they learn better by making mistakes than by not making mistakes. He said, we must design our lessons so as to invite the learner to make the minimum number of mistakes consonant with and conducive to learning new rules. Not to make massive amount of mistakes, but to here's an example. Um, okay, you've got two choices of answer to the question, how long have you been working here? So imagine you're in a language laboratory and you have to choose between for or since. Uh, and I'm going to give you some prompts and you have to tell me if it's for or since. Now, don't do this on the chat because we don't, 
don't have time, but do it in your head. Okay. So the question is, how long have you been working here? Uh, and if I say five years, the answer is four. Yeah. Okay. Six months. Four. 2017. Since. One week. Four. Last November. Since. Okay. Three weeks. Three weeks. Four. Ten years. Four. Two years ago. Two years ago. Now, how many of you were thinking four? But what the, what's the answer? Since. Yeah. Now, this is what, what students do. They hear two years. Okay, you've led them up the garden path. Five years, six months, three weeks. Then they hear two years ago. They don't notice they go. They write four. Yeah. I've been working here for two years ago. And then they have to think. They get corrected. And their hypothesis needs to be re-examined, yeah? This is uh, what Dakin was talking about. We need to lead them to make mistakes because it's only by making mistakes that they can learn the limits of the rules that they have, are using, that, that they're generalizing. So there's a whole different attitude to making mistakes. And this is not just in language learning, but all kinds of learning. Um, so according to this article in the Scientific American, Research has found that learning becomes better. Learning becomes better if conditions are arranged so that students make errors. Getting the answer wrong is a great way to learn. And this is something that uh, uh, I think makes is the major difference between the school of thought that says you should avoid errors and the school of thought says no, we should create the conditions in which learners make errors because it's through making errors uh, that they learn. Making errors and getting feedback, obviously. Uh, and of course, this is consistent with a more a humanistic view of learning, a, le a view of learning that takes into account not just students' intellectual capacities, but their feelings and emotions. Uh, and Adrian Underhill writes or wrote, in a classroom run according to humanistic values, Mistakes are no longer simply mistakes, but they are the outcomes of learners' efforts, which as such are positively valued. And he goes on to say, mistakes as outcomes become a workshop tool which can help to guide the learner's investigation. They become a tool yeah, to keep, help them develop further, to think more about the language, et cetera. And we'll see how that works in a minute. So as to the question is whether errors uh, uh, help, uh, whether correction helps, then uh, um, the evidence would suggest looking at recent um, literature, the recent literature on second language acquisition, there is clear evidence that corrective feedback contributes to learning, which teachers have always known. Yeah? Or research fairly conclusively shows the benefit uh, shows that corrective feedback can be beneficial for learners' L2 development. So that's that's good news. Those of you who are invested in correcting learners' mistakes, then this is very good. Let's l now look at the options in terms of how this could be done. Yeah, uh, and see what the and imagine what the the effect might be of different approaches. So let's imagine a learner has said in the class, "My brother is a good cooker." Now what? options does the teacher have here in terms of how they respond and i just want to look at a few and if this was a workshop i'd put you into groups and you could tell me all the different possibilities and the important thing here is that there's more than one possibility so the teacher could uh say something like no yeah give a clear signal that there's a mistake that's pretty negative it's not very helpful or he could say no and provide the correct form. Yeah, my brother was a good cook. So the very clear message that there's something wrong and this is how it's corrected. Or a, 
a variation of that might be to give some kind of explanation. No, cooker is the equipment, the thing in the kitchen for a person you say cook. Yeah? So again, a clear and explicit uh, feedback, turning the error into a kind of teaching point. On the other hand, the teacher could say, okay, learner says, my brother's a good cooker. The teacher says, my brother's a good cooker? My brother's a good cooker? So what's the teacher doing here? What's the teacher trying to do at least? The teacher's trying to elicit a self-correction yeah, by indicating that there's a problem, there's an issue. Yeah? Hoping that the learner will, or who could simply say, I'm sorry? What? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Yeah, Giving a message that there is a problem here, not identifying what it is, but uh, inviting the learner again to remedy the problem. Yeah, Or more specifically, the teacher could give some kind of prompt using terminology again to elicit a self-correction. Mm, wrong noun. Helpful? Possibly, but there's two nouns in that sentence, so not so helpful. Yeah. Um, of course, the teacher could then say, more well, helpfully, my brother is a good, my brother is a good, yeah? So we now have identified where the error is, and the learner can then attempt self-correction, yeah? But there's another possibility where the teacher could say, ah, continuing the conversation, your brother is a good cook, is he? Yeah, learner, my brother is a good cooker. Teacher, oh, your brother's a good cook, is he? So what's this? There's a correction in there, but it's kind of embedded in a natural response. It's the sort of things parents do with the children. Yeah? So child says in English, daddy shopping and the mother might say oh yeah daddy's shopping isn't he isn't he helpful isn't he useful around the home etc yeah so returning the utterance conversationally but embedding the correct form in it and this is what's called in the literature recasting recasting yeah casting it again uh or the teacher could say something like oh really what kinds of things does he cook Ignoring the error completely yeah, and just maintaining the conversation. Maybe having decided that the error is of not, it's not so important or the learner would be inhibited or humiliated, etc. And just carrying on with the conversation. Uh, and then finally, very typically, teachers often just say good because the learner said something. Yeah? Tell me about your brother. My brother's a good cooker. Good. Who else? Uh, my brother is a, uh, works in a bank. Good. Okay. My brother uh, died last year. Good. Okay. And so on. Yeah. So this is where the teacher is not interested in what the students are saying, just interested in the fact that they're saying something. And this is a, a, not a very constructive. So if we look at those different responses, we can say there's a distinction between explicit correction, you know, where it's very clear that there's an error and that there is a, or it's explicit feedback, let's say, and then a prompt for self correction and those ones. And then finally, implicit feedback. Implicit meaning it's hidden, it's not obvious, yeah? It's part of the conversation. Uh, and each of these choices is perfectly valid, but if we do only one kind of feedback, then maybe we are uh, not taking advantage of the possibilities that there are for feedback. There are many more possibilities than these, incidentally. People who research these things create these elaborate maps you see all the different possibilities where the student makes an error and the teacher notices it or doesn't notice it, et cetera. Don't worry about that. But we know that there's lots and lots and lots and lots of ways of giving feedback. Let's look at a few in context. So these are transcripts of real interactions between teachers and learners in real classrooms. Uh, and so here we have an example of uh, real negative, explicit negative feedback. So the teacher says, after they put up their tent, what did the boys do? No, they cooking food. No, no, says the teacher. Not they cooking food. Pay attention. They cook their meal. Right. They cook their meal over an open fire. So you see, this is very clear and very negative and could be, uh, it could be inhibiting. 
This one I like because the teacher does the same thing, but he doesn't, is not judgmental. Yeah. He doesn't give the mes message. Oh, you, you're wrong. You're stupid. You're not paying attention. So the learner, they're talking about uh, their weekend learner ones or two students are having a conversation about their weekend on Sunday. What did you do? Uh, I stayed in home teacher at home. Yeah. Just drops it in. Learner says on Sunday, I stayed at home and watched the Wimbledon final. What did you do on Sunday? On morning, teacher, in the morning, in the morning, I took a bus. You see what's happening here? So this teacher is correcting explicitly, but it's not interfering with the conversation. And the students are taking the corrections on board. Yeah. So I stayed in home. Teacher says at home. On Sunday, I stayed at home. Zero problem here. The students are accepting the correction and they're incorporating it. Yeah. This would seem to be... Uh, uh, a good thing to be doing. The next one comes from uh, a study done of uh, students in uh, teenage students, so high school students in the United States who are Spanish speakers uh, who are learning English through the curriculum, yeah, learning English through doing science classes, etc. And here they're doing a presentation, uh, and the teacher uh, has been asked to focus on the past tense. So Jose says, I think that the worm will go under the soil. The teacher says, I think that the worm will go under the soil. So what's she doing? She's trying to prompt a self-correction. Jose says nothing, doesn't, can't do it. So the teacher then supplies the correct version in the past tense. I thought that the worm would go under the soil. Jose, I thought that the worm would go under the soil. Yeah? So we have a, an attempt to elicit self-correction, and then the correct form, and then the student echoes it. What was interesting in this study is that they tested the students afterwards. Remember, the teacher had been told, just correct all the past tense mistakes. That's all. Nothing else. They tested the students afterwards, and they found that their knowledge of the past tense had improved. Yeah, they could do a test, and they got better results than before the activity. And that was the effect of the explicit correction. That's good news. This one, a little bit long, but uh, this is a good example of what we call recasting. Remember, recasting is when the teacher just carries on the conversation, but she incorporates the correct form into the conversation. So the teacher, we're talking about movies. She says, have you ever been to the movies? What's your favorite movie? One student says, big. Ah, big. Okay, that's a good movie. What was that? Uh, that was about a little boy inside a big man, wasn't it? Vin says, yeah, boy gets... A these are young learners and say, yeah, boy gets surprised all the time. See, yeah, boy gets surprised all the time. Teacher says, yes, he was surprised, wasn't he? Usually little boys don't do the things that men do, do they? You see what's going on here? So keeping the conversation going and no explicit correction. And then Vin says, no, little boy, no drink. And the teacher says, that's right, little boys don't drink. So this is a classic example of recasting, yeah, of the teacher carrying on the conversation, dropping in the corrections, hoping oh, that the student will notice, or at least other students will notice. Now, the big question, of course, is do they notice? Yeah? Do they notice if there's no explicit correction? Uh, and so a lot of research has been done the last few years on exactly this, on recasts. Do students benefit from this kind of implicit feedback. And again, I would love to ask your opinion here, what you think of this, whether you think it's effective or not. It's certainly effective in terms of maintaining yeah, communication, but is it effective in terms of learning? Uh, and people who have been researching this have come up with some interesting uh, conclusions. Um, Roy Lister, who's a, uh, a researcher in Canada, has found that it's the high ability learners who notice these recasts more than the low ability learners, yeah? which is kind of bad news really, because it's the low ability learners we want to reach. So the high ability learners notice things like recasts, like, ah, he doesn't, he, little boys don't drink, do they? But the low ability ones don't. Um, pronunciation or phonological errors are more noticeable than grammatical errors when teachers recast. So when the teacher says the same thing, but with better pronunciation, 
yeah, learners notice that, but not necessarily grammar. And it may be the stage they're at and their development. Yeah. So if the learner recast may benefit language development when learner has already begun to use a particular linguistic feature, you know, when they've already begun to use it, and this gives them a little bit more information and helps them move towards the target. Um, so good news and bad news about um, correction, uh, recast. I'm just going to skip ahead a bit uh, and add another comment by Roy Lister that he says it is actually, uh, this is on the question of whether we should give immediate feedback or delayed feedback, yeah? Feedback while they're speaking, like remember the one when the students are talking about their weekend? At weekend, I in the wheel, whatever he said, uh, in home, I stay in home, teacher at home, I stayed at home, yeah? During the conversation, or should they wait until after? And the general feeling is that uh, on teacher training courses, at least, is that you should wait till after the conversation, because otherwise you will interrupt the conversation. But there's plenty of evidence, Roy Lister says here, plenty of classroom studies have shown that teachers are able to provide various forms of corrective feedback in ways that allow the communicative flow to continue. And so we need to kind of work towards incorporating that kind of feedback because it's evidence shows that this kind of feedback during the flow is the flow feedback that makes most sense to the learners. They can compare what they said with what the teachers just said. Whereas if it's after the event, it's kind of too late. But we have to do it in a way that doesn't break the communication. It's the difference between interfe intervening, intervening like the teacher did, who said at home, oh, um, or interfering or interrupting even, which is the negative form. Um, let's look at written language. And this is an activity, I'm not sure if I described it to you. I think I did on a recent talk where students write conversations to each other, yeah, as if they were texting. And this is fantastic because by being written down, the teacher can go and give immediate feedback as I did here in line four, it isn't your problem, I said, I corrected that, it isn't your business. And then I added the expression, mind your own business, yeah? So I'm going through while they're writing their conversation backwards and forwards, it's available for me to correct almost at the point where they made the error. Uh, another activity that uh, I like, but which is after the error, a long time after, is collecting examples from their homework uh, and putting them onto a worksheet or projecting them on the next lesson without saying who made the error and the students go into groups and work out how to correct them. I did, I, my students love this. They love it because they recognize the error if it's theirs and they also recognize the kind of error uh, and they uh, love working on these to, to, to sort them out. And this um, reminds me of an activity or a sequence or a, a technique that uh, an Australian colleague of mine uses or used with his classes in Thailand for writing. Uh, and I'll just talk you quickly through this before we end, but I think it's a good example of how, uh, how learners can take responsibility for correction. It's not just the teacher. Yeah? So it's a similar activity to this. So let me just explain it very quickly. So the teacher, the Students have done a written activity, yeah? a composition or whatever. The teacher takes in the compositions and simply ticks yeah, the sentences which are correct. Yeah? So the ones that are not ticked, there's obviously an error, but he, the teacher gives no indication. The student then takes this back and attempts self-correction and the gives it to the teacher again. And the teacher does the same thing, giving no focus correction in this case, but encouraging the learner to look at these sentences carefully. Now, the students who are able to correct most of their own sentences become the group leaders for the next stage of the activity, the so-called more competent peers. 
And they go to groups around the classroom or breakout rooms if you're teaching online and become workstations. And exactly the same process is repeated where the other students come to that group leader and the group leader goes through the composition and ticks the sentences as correct and they go back and forth and they can't discuss them, etc. And this is repeated. And the teacher, Brad, commented that he did this in, uh, I think it was Thailand, with large classes with 50 or more students where there are multiple workstations in a single class. Yeah, so the group leader with two or three other students and the students could choose which group leader they wanted to go to. Uh, and he says this saved a lot of classroom time, these multiple workstations. Uh, and it allows students more choices about who they want to work with regarding their written errors. So it gives the learners a little bit of choice here uh, because uh, certain group leaders may be more sympathetic or whatever than others or more helpful. And finally, he said, uh, teachers can access the work of weaker students by requesting to see the work of any particular student. So the teacher is not out of action here. The teacher is going around also uh, keeping an eye and look students who are un unable to correct their own written work, even with help, that's when the teacher can come in. So I think this comes back to the last point in our questionnaire I gave you at the beginning that yes, definitely, learners' mistakes can provide useful material for teaching. So um, we're 45 minutes in. Uh, we have 15 minutes for questions. So, um, and I think Kavya has collected some questions for me, hopefully. Uh, and let's see if we can deal with them. It was a truly wonderful session, Mr. Thornberry. In India, where English is the medium of instruction in many schools and taught as a second language in the rest, error correction plays a crucial role. It also plays a significant part in assessment and evaluation. The insights and strategies shared in your session will help teachers deal with errors constructively. May I now request my colleague, Kavya Sharma, Senior Editor, Orion Black Swan, to anchor the discussion and relay the questions from the participants. Uh, thank you, Devina. Uh, Mr. Thornberry, that was a very enlightening session. It is such an incredibly important topic uh, for our teachers. Uh, you've shared such great insights into how corrective feedback can be implemented in the classrooms. Uh, so let's just get to the questions. Um, okay. So the first question is, how do we keep the error correcting experience positive for the students? Um, yes, just to avoid them, just, just so they don't get demotivated. Yeah, good question. And I think I should have mentioned with my example, for example, uh, my brother is a good cooker. Um, another approach to that might be to say, the teacher laughs and says, ah, ha, ha. Is he an electric cooker or a gas cooker? Now that would be kind of negative because it's making fun of the student's error. Of course, the student may never forget that error, but I think that's a very dangerous strategy. Alternatively, the teacher could say, that's a fantastic error you've just made because what you're doing, yeah, is that you are generalizing the rule, yeah, teach the verb, teacher the noun, work the verb, worker the noun, build the verb, builder the noun, cook the verb, no. The noun is for the thing, but not for the person, yeah? But it's a great, you, you know, you're using your head. So I think we can, if we, it's the attitude of saying, yeah, that's fantastic. I love that error. Let's look at it. Now being very positive about the errors, not saying, oh, that's, we did that yesterday. Or, you know, haven't you been, st no, 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 no. Um, we should, welcome errors because this is the stuff of language learning this is the raw material of language learning i think this is what your webinar has addressed looking at mistakes as a po positive uh, opportunity for the learners to understand the language better Absolutely. um so uh, just uh, like related to what we just spoke about how do we deal with situations where students continue to make the same errors again and again 
Um, Even after being corrected. Yeah. Well, I think, again, we, do, we shouldn't get impatient with errors, uh, with learners, because they repeat it. As we saw, things like the third person S, for example, or uh, errors uh, with articles or prepositions uh, take a long time before they work through the system. And sometimes they never do. Sometimes they never do. Learners keep making those mistakes, however much they get corrected. I have the same problem in learning and speaking Spanish because we have this gender in Spanish, yeah, masculine and feminine, but there isn't in English. And it's there's no sense to it often. You go, what, what, why, why is the table feminine and the chair is masculine, et cetera? So, um, so you, just, you just ignore it. And however much feedback you get, it doesn't actually necessarily make a lot of difference. It's a question of time. So I don't think we should get impatient, but nor should we stop giving feedback because you know, there's an equal danger if we stop giving feedback or correction then that, that error will, in a sense, fossilize, it will become entrenched. Um, so it's just, it takes time, you know, it takes time, it takes children that time in their first language. How many times do children, or do parents correct their children when they say, uh, he wented to work yesterday? And say, no, 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 he went to work yesterday. It takes time, it takes a year, maybe, to sort itself out. Um, the next question is about using drills as a technique. And I remember you did talk about this during your first uh, OBS1 seminar uh, webinar back, uh, back then. But in the context of error correction, do you think drill, um, whether oral or written, is an effective strategy? Well, I have to say, um, I mean, I, as I said before, Kavya, when I was first trained, I was trained very much in the methodology, which was very accuracy focused and very, and, and use a lot of drilling. And uh, students were great while they were drilling. You know, while they were drilling, they weren't making mistakes. They were all repeating together. And it was, and also gave me 100% control of the class, which for a new teacher is very important, especially if you have a large class or young class. Um, but, you know, as soon as the drill was finished and they started, we started doing something more less controlled, more creative, then those errors came back again. Yeah. So it seemed to me that the drilling really wasn't helping, certainly not in the short term. And I don't think in the long term, uh, it's, it is difficult to know what the best strategy is for, for uh, uh, particular errors. Um, but I think having students just simply repeat the correct form again and again and again is not actually hasn't been shown to be very effective. Right. Okay. Um, next question is about the mother tongue influence that we spoke about right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a major cause for students to make errors in English, especially in Indian classrooms. So how do you suggest we minimize these errors? Well, again, I mean, I, I don't think, I don't think it's a disaster you know, it's inevitable. We just have to accept that. What we can do is, is perhaps accelerate the process, that's the interlanguage process that students go through, that they would go through normally if they had no instruction, but they were just like, you know, reading and speaking and listening to a lot of English, but without the teacher. What the teacher can do is provide focused feedback, which hopefully will reduce the time from getting from A to B. Um, but it's, uh, it's a fairly, <laughs> I have to say, random process. It's a, it's a bit like, you know, throwing mud on a wall. Some of it will stick, some of it won't. But if it doesn't stick for that individual student, it may stick for the other students. Yes. There's quite a lot of learning goes on, incidentally, where students are witness to the feedback that another student's getting. So it may not affect that student necessarily, but it may the other ones may notice or some of them, et cetera. So it's something that we have to keep doing, but we have to recognize that there's no instant results. And I think uh, coming back to the question of first language interference, we have to look at the first language as also being a positive factor that it can provide. That's not everything about the first language is bad. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be borrowed from the first language, even if it's a language like Hindi, that's not in the same language group necessarily as English. There's still, you know, features of uh, the first language which can be 
imported into the second language. But the other thing is um, we can't eradicate the first language from the classroom. Even if we say to the students, you must speak English, no Hindi or whatever, they're going to be thinking in Hindi or Gujarati or Tamil or whatever. You can't, bat, you can't change the way people think. So you might as well bring it out in the open. And one strategy is say, well, let's look. How would you say this? Uh, how long have you been working, for example? How long have you been working? That's the sentence in English. How would you say this in your first language? Yeah? In Tamil, let's say. And then compare, say, well, it's structurally different. So, so it's raising students' awareness about the differences so that they have got, um, so they don't, you know, uh, keep repeating the same mistakes. They become more conscious. And I think a lot of comparison across languages is really, really useful. If you have a class, it all speaks the same first language. Let's have a look at the difference between Gujarati, let's say, and English. Kavya, any more questions? Um, yes, actually, this brings us to our next question, uh, Mr. Thornberry. Uh, at what stage in school uh, does a focus on uh, language accuracy become important? Ah, well, I mean, <laughs> does it or should it? Um, I mean, depending on the teacher and depending on the curriculum and the exams and everything, the focus on accuracy is often very early. Uh, and there's a good argument to suggest that maybe this is uh, ill-advised, that the focus on accuracy should come later, that accuracy, when you're learning a language, whether it's your first language or your second language, accuracy is a late stage. When we're learning our first language, we're not accurate. As I said before, mm -hmm. when we're learning, when I was learning English as an 18 month year old, I was not accurate. I was not accurate when I was two. I was not accurate when I was three. I was not accurate when I was six. And grammatically and with in writing, I wasn't accurate until I was 16. Yeah. So if it, that's the case of the first language, how can we expect learners in a second language to be accurate from day one? It's ridiculous. It's not fair. Yeah. So accuracy is something like I like to think of the metaphor of the icing on the cake. You know what ice, you know, the icing, the, the sweet, right. <laughs> the bit that everybody likes, but it comes right. after. It's after the cake. It's decoration. It's not part of the cake. Yeah? The cake right. is communication, fluency, intelligible, intelligibility. The icing is the accuracy. Right. Okay. Uh, I Maybe we yes. have some fresh questions, you know, which we can address before we close. Yes, yes. Uh, we have a question from Mamta Mai Pradhan. Uh, she, she asks how to deal with different types of students, uh, poor, average, and intelligent in a curriculum, in a classroom, uh, uh, while addressing uh, the different kind of errors that they make. So is there any methodology to treat, to teach all three varieties of uh, a mixed ability class, basically. Uh, no, but as I said before, by um, being strategic uh, and sensitive in your correction, uh, you know, if you correct the brighter students, hopefully the, the less proficient students will pick up on those. But if you only correct the less proficient students, you will inhibit them and make them feel humiliated in that. So in some ways, it's maybe better to correct the better students to pull the class with them. Uh, but I mean, I would say it's for me, it's less. Yeah, every class is, has diversity uh, in terms of proficiency, but more significantly, a diversity in terms of personality and learning uh, approach, yeah? preferences, etc. So we need to be just as sensitive to their personalities, not, not only thinking about them as being weak or strong students but we've got inhibited students, uninhibited students, yeah? students who are, uh, you know, ha who are naturally communicative, even in their first language and not naturally communicative, yeah. et cetera. These are the kinds of distinctions. I just saw one question here, uh, Kavya, I'd like to answer. It came up so, in the question and answer from Krupal Yadav. It says, how do we arrange conditions so that the students can yes. make errors? Yes. And I think that's a great question. And yes. one way, well, we don't arrange conditions so that students can't make errors. Uh, what, uh, 
that that's the traditional way where the students are not allowed to say anything that they haven't already heard the teacher say or that hasn't isn't written in the book that's the way of preventing students from making errors by by providing the conditions for them to make errors you have activities which are less controlled yeah where they can say what they want yeah where you say to them tell me about your weekend now how was it and the students go uh, yeah, uh, in weekend, I uh, go to my village and uh, we have a feast. You say, okay, great, fantastic. You went to your village, had a feast. What did you eat? Did you cook? Blah, 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 etc. So you're, you're saying you can say whatever you want. Yeah, it's a community. Event. Talk about yourself, your life, your interests, yeah, your experiences, your hopes, your ambitions, etc. These kinds of activities. The students are invited to be creative with language within their existing competence. And then you can take that language and say, that's great. That's fantastic. Let's look at that. Yeah. Let's write it up and see what did, you know, what did Krupal just tell us and write it on the board and say, okay, let's, let's, let's fix this up. Let's bring this nearer to the target and use that student's language and be grateful to that student. So that's fantastic. Thank you for telling us about your weekend. Now we're going to tidy it up for you. Right, right. Uh, so this is the last question, Mr. Thornberry. Uh, how does peer feedback uh, help students um, in error correction? Does that help? The, you actually did uh, speak about this a little bit, how sensitive students might not take too well to that. So uh, could you explain, uh, could you elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the most negative, uh, let me tell you a quick story. My, uh, my niece was visiting me here in Spain a few years ago uh, for uh, three weeks. She, was, she had been working in, in uh, Europe as an au pair and she came for a holiday. And so I thought it'd be nice to enroll her in a Spanish class in the school where I was working. And so she went to the class and she stayed for about two lessons and then she dropped it. And I said to her, Libby, why did you stop going to the class? And she said, the teacher corrected me. So that's the really, <laughs> that's the really negative thing about correction. She stopped going. So that's what we don't want, yeah? So we need to do it in sensitive ways that students don't feel um, humiliated. But at the same time, we shouldn't stop doing it because students are, 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 may be anxious. We have to do it in a nice way, but we've got to keep, I mean, the evidence, as I said before, the evidence is strong that, yes, corrective feedback is useful. It's not, uh, it, it's not the only thing, though, that we should be doing. I mean, people do learn languages by just going to the country and speaking it, etc., and not getting corrective feedback. But I think one of the great things about classrooms is that you're getting corrective feedback from teachers, and it's done in a way which helps you, and it's positive, uh, and it makes the process of learning the language faster theoretically than if you were just going right. you know talking to people in the street right okay that was the last question of the day mr thornberry thank you so much and uh, we hope to see you again <laughs> over to the bina thank you Pavia, and thank you mr thornberry for a very informative session most of us will agree that many language teachers face difficulties by correcting the errors of their students it is not always easy to know when and if to correct students and how to go about it. Overcorrection may affect motivation and not correcting the errors may lead to fossilized errors. Your webinar will definitely help teachers will overcome this dilemma and help them correct the errors at appropriate times. I would also like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. We'd love to hear from you. Please do share your feedback with us. Wishing all of you a very good day from all of us at Orient Black Swan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.